Dracula Dungeon. Man, it is really dark out tonight. I know, I know it's probably silly to be afraid of werewolves, but I am anyway. I mean, up until a few days ago, yeah, I would have thought it was silly to be afraid of being chased by a cult and making friends with a freak. Okay, that's mean. I mean, he's not that bad. I mean, he can make his eyes go blue and hypnotize people, but well, it is pretty freaky. So this Billy, my new friend, he, he says we're being chased by a cult of murderers. And they want me too. I don't know why they would want me. I mean, I mean, I do. I am the smartest kid in town. I mean, I did get the best scores in the standardized testing. But other than that, I don't know why a cult of murderers would want me. But here I am helping Billy break into a school after dark because he thinks the principal is one of them. O-S-H-I-T. What is my scout leader doing outside the school at this time of night? I better, hold on Billy. I better, I better talk him. Uh, I better talk my way through this before Billy's eyes start glowing red, blue again. All right, so I'm gonna roll. My target number, GM told me it's seven. I'm gonna use my charm die, which is a D10. I'm gonna try to charm this guy. Five. Well, <laughs> I didn't make it. Oh, Billy's eyes are starting to glow blue. I guess that's better than getting kicked out of the Boy Scouts. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Viva La Dungeon. I'm Kevin from level 9 of the dungeon. Thanks for joining me, Joker. Precious Paul, buddy. Turk. Tonight, we are going to talk about kids on bikes. It's a sweet little mini role-playing game. Uh, and, of course, some Star Jumper news. And then we'll do... Uh, we've got a special Dungeon Crawl Classics module to go through called People of the Pit. That little bit in the beginning was um, give you a taste of what kids in the bikes like. Kids on Bikes came out a couple years ago, right around the same time, I would say, coincidentally enough, right around the same time Stranger Things came out. If you like Stranger Things, and uh, th then you're gonna love this fucking game, period. By the way, everybody join me in chat. I added a new function. So if you, if I get riffing too fast, or I'm just going off and off and off and I'm not paying attention to you, because you're important to me, yeah, over here, because you're right there. Um, because you're important to me, then um, hit the uh, exclamation point question. And that will alert me that somebody needs my attention in case I go off a tangent. Um, no, you haven't missed anything, uh, Turk. I was just, I did a little intro as um, what it's like to play kids on bikes. Uh, so kids on bikes, it's, um, there's a lot of cool little, it's, 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 a, it's a full-on role-playing game. I said it's little before, but it's not little. It's it's a full-on role-playing game. And um, it's actually pops up quite a bit on Twitch, if you know where to look. Uh, the uh, There's like three cool ideas I'm going to focus on on this role-playing game to talk about. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to kind of cover those. Starting with the first thing is... Well, actually, let me tell you what, what this game's about. This game's about kids on bikes. It's about the time when between, um, you know, younger kids, when they just for, just learned um, or just started riding their bike and are allowed to run free in the neighborhood to uh, teenage when they're literally running free. It's set in, typically set in small towns, places where you could ride your bike from one end of town to the next. Um, they say, you know, it's preferable to play in a time period where there weren't, you know, uh, computers in our pockets. But I think that could be that. I mean, that could be fine too. I, I'm pretty sure you could figure out a way to make that work as well. In fact, there'd be new, cooler ways, new, co cool horrors and weirdness and fantasy that come about from having your phones and that kind of thing. It could be really fun. But that kind of segues into our first kind of cool thing about this game is, uh, like a lot of the modern games, especially Apocalypse World, which I talked about before. <laughs> What's up, Collecting Bricks? Ah, oh, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. Lots of kids still ride bikes, riding around the neighborhood. I see them in my neighborhood all the time. So, uh, first thing you do when you sit down to talk, there is this is not GM-less, there is a GM in this game. Uh, but the GM sits down with the players and you all talk about the setting. You do it all together. You figure out what kind of town it is, where it is, and when it is. Uh, some and like I said, some you want to preferably create a town that's like ten, no more than ten miles of where they can ride their bike in a day. Everybody contributes uh, a, a landmark, 
of note. You leave blank spaces, you know, on the map when you're thinking about it. Everybody names a, a, a cool, like there's the uh, abandoned fa steel factory, or there's the um, the carnival fair that just never has never left, that kind of thing. Um, maybe even going as far as naming the school, that kind of stuff. So everybody sits down, they talk about the uh, town, and then they start making their characters. Characters are all, uh, you choose a trope. Instead of a class, you choose a trope. Uh, everything from uh, laid back slacker to loner weirdo. Uh, I've never met one of those before. <laughs> uh, overprotective parent, plastic beauty, and you don't have to play a kid, but uh, a lot of times this is kind of made for the whole kid thing. Popular kid, reclusive eccentric, a bunch of different tropes you can play. Uh, the way the stats work in this game is uh, there's uh, brains, grit, charm, brawn, flight, and fight. And, and depending on the trope you pick, uh, there's a different D die, uh, die assigned to that uh, stat, depending on how good you are. The scout, which is what I was playing that character right in the beginning, uh, the scout has a D20 in brains. So anytime there's anything he's got to do, uh, you know, through using his brains, he, he rolls a D20. The game master sets a difficulty challenge, and he's got to beat it. He or she's got to beat it with a D20. Uh, fight for a scout, though, is a D4. So if they're going to be fighting, there's, they're going to have a little bit of a, you know, little tr uh, they're going to have a tough time. I'll get into more a little bit later about how the die rolls work and stuff because there's a couple of cool things in that. Um, the uh, and then uh, once you've picked your trope, give yourself a name, that kind of stuff. There's a lot of different little things to building the character as a group. Oh well, first thing you do is you pick a couple possible strengths from a list that's provided and a couple flaws. I picked. Um, cool under pressure and lucky and then for likely flaws for my scout I did um boastful and uh I forgot what, oh superstitious so I was like he's afraid of werewolves he's he's bragging about being the smartest kid in town uh but he's like got his head on straight and when they runs into the the um the scout leader he doesn't panic or anything like that uh and then there's each trope comes with a couple questions that you answer for him like who first got you into the scouts or what do you have to give? Uh, what do you have to give up to spend as much time in nature as you do? So that's all personal stuff you do for the for uh, for the character, and that's you know that's kind of typical shit, right? Where the game kind of shines a little bit in character creation is what comes next. Once you have your kind of character set down, everybody introduces them and stuff. You pick people in the group that you are have positive experiences with, and people you have uh, negative kind of experiences with in your play group, and. Uh, Put this right here. I made myself bigger. Look at that. I'm the O. People in dungeon. Uh, and then you go around the table. If you're doing a full-on, full game, the way you're supposed to do it is you pick like uh, two questions for somebody you're positive with, and one question for somebody you're negative with. Out of these, out of this long list in the back of things, um, characters you know and characters you don't know. Let's put it that way. Is, is that how they do it? Characters. They have questions for characters you don't know too. Oh yeah. So everybody gets one of these and they answer them about the other pl players. You do this for every other player in your group. Uh, things like, uh, what trait about this character that, that they despise do you generally appreciate? Like the scout might be, might uh, uh, despise the fact that um, he's superstitious, superstitious, or that he can't fight. But we love that about him. Um, what are what are you sure what are you sure this character is hiding from you these are these are great you're gonna see this next week I'm gonna talk about dungeon world and uh, this is you kind of saw a little bit of this in apocalypse world too the whole history thing that's what I dig that's what really got me into modern storytelling is the idea that you're sitting down I haven't yet to play a full campaign with a bunch of people who could really like really grok this kind of stuff but to really figure out right away what our relationships are and have some instigate uh, and instead of just coming up off of nowhere with it launching out of nowhere have some like uh, inspiration for how you kind of craft that relationship with with the rest of the people in the group and you don't have to like everybody you like you don't have to get along the scout doesn't have could still be still hate the jock for having picked on him in fifth grade or you know in third grade even though he might not be a bully so much now, or maybe he still is a fucking bully, but maybe he's a bully you need in your group right now. Um, what is your private nickname for this character and why? <laughs> See, that's fun, <laughs> for sure. 
Um, so once you got all that, you kind of sit down, you got all that. This is like a big part of the game, right? Session zero. And you've got your relations up, relationships all figured out. You start playing the game. And like most role-playing games, the GM starts out. He's got kind of idea where, where to go, where to start off with based on the setting you've come up with. Um, within a few minutes, this is what they, the book tells you, but it's up to the GM when they want to reveal this. But another character comes into play, and that's the second thing that's really kind of cool about this game. Is um, And this is totally, I don't know how much Stranger Things influenced this, if this was at the same time, I don't know. It's like It came out just after, or right around the same time. So it's really cool is like the GM introduces for every... Um, for every story, we'll call it a story, like the beginning, it could be a one game or it could be a series of games, it can be a campaign. But they bring in, they introduce a NPC called the Powered Character, and this is Eleven. For the for lack of a, the, the best example of a Powered Character, period. Uh, the GM introduces Eleven. The GM had created Eleven um, based on... Um, all these different, not all these, but all these different, uh, yeah, it is all, all these different aspects, he call, they call them. And that character is going to have two aspects, at least, for each other player um, that's going to be playing. This NPC, the cool thing about this NPC is everybody gets a shot at um, playing the NPC, the powered character, uh, through these aspects. So the GM will uh, maybe randomly give each player two of the aspects of this powered character. Aspects are things like scared of dogs. It could be personality things. Creative. But also, and this is the meat, the meat and potato stuff, right? They could have, they have psychic powers. They could do stuff. Be able, able to change their body's density. This is all comes from a bunch of, a bunch of options in the back. And I think they sell cards that you can get to kind of randomized how how you draw these able to fire bursts of energy from their hands um, able to lift much more than normal uh, able to astrally project so and then things like mimic a member of the group mimics a member of the group talkative with members of the group tries to spread forbidden knowledge these are all aspects that get written on a card and then uh, each player has two of them. And throughout the game, and throughout the story, anytime you uh, feel like this would be a good time for my character I'd made up was called Billy, uh, and for the in intro to the show. Anytime I'd feel like, okay, now's the time Billy needs to charm somebody, he can hypnotize somebody with his eyes, I'm gonna say, okay, I'm, Billy's gonna use his power. And I'd, I'd like turn over the card or something, I'd let everybody know. And then if it's somebody else's card, let's say I was, I thought, oh, this would be a really good time for Billy to mimic Josie, right? Because he's got the mimics another player in the group. So I'd, I would I'd talk to the other player and say, hey, this would be a really good time for you to play that. And they, and they decide whether or not they want to play it. The power character comes with a currency of sorts called a um, psychic energy tokens. They start with, I think, seven. And uh, to, to do one of their aspects, they got to pay psychic energy. And... Um, if they want to do something like actually like if like um uh you want to charm somebody with his eyes or do something like um 11 would do and then they would have to roll dice just like you would have to roll dice for the second for the power character just like you would for anybody else in order to perform that and the second character always rolls two d4s and then you can add um their psychic tokens to that if they haven't gotten over the number the gm gave you and this kind of represents this push and pull where um, they start getting tired, like Eleven's nose starts bleeding, that kind of shit. Like, um, if they make the roll, then uh, there might be a toll. If they don't make the roll, there's definitely a toll, that kind of thing. So the character uh, the character has their own uh, limits, and but that's shared through the group and the group narrative. This is like the modern role-playing games where, story games where everyone's responsible for the story and we're all conscious of the narrative and we're all contributing to make a cool story. <laughs> hey, that's my bike! And then just drive off. <laughs> Alright, let's see. Um, Alright, so... A couple of... Well, I'll, I'll talk about the... Um, yeah, I'll talk about the decisions. It's not the biggest. I mean, it's a it's a cool it's a it's a nifty little system. Um, it's <clears throat> the the whole every one of your stats is tied to a different die type of die, and then the GM sets a number, and you got to roll. Um, a couple things about it though is uh, 
you oh oh here's here's a cool thing if you not that that's not cool i'm not trying to downplay i'm just saying uh it's 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 a cool little system uh the uh, the failing if you fail a roll narratively it's not supposed to be that it's supposed to just trigger a new a new thing it's not supposed to be like you fail like it's like it's death or something it's like it it just means that um the story goes in a different direction you weren't able to get the information from the one guy so now you have to go all the way across town to get information from the old grandma or something but when you or whenever you fail a role you get an adversity token and then that adversity token you can use on your your future roles to add plus one for each one you spend and you can do it do use it on somebody else's roles too so Josie goes to roll, I could spend my adversity tokens to help her make that roll. So there's a little bonus for failing, which isn't is a terrible thing. It's pretty pretty cool actually. And then uh, and then there's exploding dice. So if you uh, if you roll your die, whatever die you've got to roll, let's say if it's a four-sided die, and, and you roll a four, uh, then you explode the die. So you get to roll again and add that total. And you could keep exploding. If you keep rolling fours, you'd keep rolling fours. And uh, so you got that kind of going for you too. Um, the game isn't made for, uh, well, I know, I'm sorry, I, you know, it is. I was gonna say it's not made for for campaigns, but that's bullshit. It's definitely made for campaigns. You could definitely play, camp oh, what I was gonna say, what my thought was is it's not, there isn't a huge, there isn't a really baked in leveling up kind of system for it, even though it's, you know, you play long stories with it. Um, the leveling up is kind of cool, actually, when I think about it because it's more of what makes the most sense for the story and what's going on and you work with the GM to like if it, if you really think okay look he's been watching uh, uh, Josie a lot on how she does X Y and Z or Josie's been working with him to uh, to uh, work out and get a little bit of strength can we move from a d4 to a d6 on his strength or, or his fight or you say somebody Josie's been showing him how to punch <laughs> right and so if that makes sense then maybe that happens or um uh or maybe you get a new maybe get rid of uh you like he doesn't no longer feel so superstitious so he picks another weakness or another strength or something along those lines so uh the leveling up is even more about well how does this story go if you want a really kick-ass example of this game played that's actually pretty high profile uh hyper rpg does a show called Colic. It's, it's the name of the town, C O L L O K, and um, they've been running for months now. And uh, it's super. It's pretty interactive. Some really incredibly cool interactivity between the audience and the and the stream, where the GM will um, uh, announce a question, have everybody poll during a break, and then they'll they'll end up either adding new characters to the game or having something else happen. Uh, to kind of shake up the um, the uh, the group, and they'll even film in different kind of locations, which is pretty cool, like in a booth, at like a restaurant and stuff. But they're playing kids in a in this weird ass town. They have this, and they have their power characters, crazy time traveler and fucking thing. It's it's pretty crazy. Colic, and uh, check it out on Hyper RPG. This was gonna be this is gonna be the long. I don't know if this is gonna be the longest episode tonight. We have. I mean, I'm gonna go pretty far into people a pit, but there wasn't a whole lot more I need to say about kids on bikes. I I think it's a pretty cool system. I I'd loved. I haven't had a chance to to run it. Uh, I'd love to to check it out uh, to get it played though. Uh, there was some cool ideas in there. Even if it was just to sit down and come up with the town, the characters. Actually, once you do that, man, you just gotta you gotta run it right. You gotta play it. But that was kids on bikes. Uh, yeah. You guys got any questions? I'd like to field some questions. The floor is yours. What are we talking about ferrets? Yeah, exactly. Once you make the world, man, it's it's all you got to. You got to keep going. Let's fucking make a world right now. All right, so you um, what small town? What's small town Northern California like? Because I know what small town Michigan is like. And uh, it's almost exactly like uh, Stranger Things. <laughs> but small town Northern California, kind of deserty. Small town South Carolina, a lot of mess. Oh, that's too bad. I thought you guys were in North, Carol uh, North California. You're in South Car Cal California. 
Okay. But still, like, desert though, right? Because you guys are close to wasteland and stuff. Nice. Nice. This song title just came on, the one that just started right now, it's called Shimmering Mirage. It's kind of... So the town's name is Mirage. Mirage, California. There's, um... There's an old military base that was, like, started a long time ago, but then... Like, it was, like, a base. They started it, and then they stopped it. Some kind of budget issues or something. So they never actually completed it. No one actually was stationed there. But there's still some buildings and a fence and shit. At least that's what the government wants us to believe. <laughs> we, need, we need at least two more locations. Mirage, California. Oh, yeah. Lots of graffiti inside the, mili oh, the abandoned military base. Hell, yeah. Probably a couple, um, like, locked, locked, not doors, but, like, things in the ground, like, what, what's, uh, hatches, locked hatches for some reason. Maybe they're bolted down. Ooh, I like abandoned elementary school, too. Ah, one park. All right, so there's a park. Um, a park that doesn't get as, as much use for some reason. Or maybe, maybe just around the pond. With a nasty green lake. <laughs> Sounds like a shit <laughs> Well, I mean, that'd be the best place for something shitty to happen, right? One security guard at the, at the, um, at the park. Exactly at nine. This is getting really specific, Turk. I love it. <laughs> Super stickler. Well, he's got to get home. He's got to watch his uh, The Bachelor, right? Oh, actually, what year is this set in? Should we go old, oldish, like 50s or 60s? Or should it be um, 70s? Is interesting. 1964, 96. 96 ain't bad either. That's probably when you were riding around on your bike, Turk, right? Booming in the 70s. What up, Dustin? We're creating a town for kids on bikes. It's uh, California Mirage. It's called Mirage. There's a, uh, a halfway constructed military base, kind of abandoned, never never used. A old elementary school. A park that's uh, got a really nasty lake. That's only one only one park in town. There's one guard that kind of keep walks around the park grounds. I'm assuming. Always leaves at nine promptly. We're kind of, kind of um, trying to decide between 1964 or 96 is the is the year. Right, 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 right. I'll go with 96. Mirage, California, 1996. Oh, oh, oh. Ooh, maybe the, does the guard, is the guard, does, can the guard be bribed to let the teenager hang out and drink and do shit? Yeah. <laughs> you had hair in 96, that's awesome. <laughs> does the guard, can the guard be bribed? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he figures, you know what? It's they're gonna do it anyway. As long as they do it in the park, he can clean up later. There's no getting in trouble. You know what I mean? Oh, maybe he maybe he supplies a little bit and he goes home and gets drunk and watches the. It's a '96. He watches uh, Friends. Yeah, that's easy too. Just that way as a kid too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't. He doesn't need to take any money from him. He ain't. Need to, yeah. Yeah. He knows where where they are. When he gets, anything goes down, he knows exactly where to send uh, cops if he needs to be needs to. But one night the kids go there, and uh, 
usually he sees them in because he wants to see if there's any new kids or you know see if it's the same kids or something and he's not there and then he's not there the next night right concrete abandoned abandoned community concrete community center with a little uh, with a little um amphitheater too <laughs> surprisingly dominant football team <laughs> so one night he's not there next night he's not there how many nights before we go looking and how uh, going knocking on his door we, he's got a son Is his son missing too three nights and they're like well maybe we should go check out if I wonder if his son's di disappeared too or if he's if he's he's not one of the players right oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's a weekend it's a weekend and uh, and his son is gone. Is always goes to stay with his mom, and every other weekend. I mean, his nineties, lots of divorces, divorcings. I was, I was a divorced kid. All right, let's see. I want to. The fuck, where are my aspects? Uh, who is the power who how do we meet the powered kid we have the powered kid um huh maybe uh maybe they uh the third night, on the third night, oh wait, no, no, no. So on the third night, they go to his house and they don't find him, but somebody is there. Somebody else is there. And that's how we introduce our powered character. I'll go guy because it doesn't want to, we don't have, it doesn't have to be 11. Or maybe it's a baby? Someone who's uh, able to create illusions. Oh, I like it. The guard found a baby, right? Oh shit, maybe. Okay, hold on, hold on. Maybe the baby did something to him without really meaning to. Maybe the baby, the first power. Right, right, right. He found this baby. Don't know how. That's how we had, that's what we'd have to figure out during play. The baby. Okay, I'm not I'm not gonna reveal this to you guys. <laughs> I'm not, actually, we're, we're gonna stop right there. I'm not gonna go any further with that mystery because I I got that first part figured out. No, the no. That's that's what you guys go. You go to the house. You knock on the door. You hear a baby crying. The door is locked. All the lights are off. You finally get the nerve up. You're like, fuck it. We're gonna break in the house. You break in his house. You find a baby sitting on the kitchen floor, like uh, crying, very very hungry. One of you has a baby brother or sister, so you feel like, okay, I can I can do this. And now that's where we kind of start. Is <laughs> oh oh I thought you meant we got to question the baby. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta, we gotta, we gotta get in on this. What, what's up, baby? <laughs> but maybe, I mean, and so the baby is our power character, and that's where the, that's where the whole adventure starts. This guard, and you, you're gonna want to find out. Oh, I see what you mean to, to find out where. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and get a natty twenty, and the baby starts talking. <laughs> you find a note in its diaper. It tells you exactly what's going on. 
But yeah, maybe there's a, or maybe you start talking to babysitters in town to see if maybe he had used a babysitter at some point. Because you're like, you know that uh, Tim, his son, never talked about having a baby brother or a sister or whatever it is. Um, why would he be all by himself? Maybe you try calling Timmy and you don't get him, you find his number, his mom's number, but they're not answering either for some reason. There, boom, we got the beginning of a kids on bikes thing. <laughs> that would be a perfect baby voice. <laughs> All right, we're moving on. Star jumpers. Got some cool news. I I uh, found out about Gen Con. They, the first exposure hall, which is this... Um, uh, First Exposure Hall is a really cool place because what it does is... All right, let me, let me back up. Gen Con, you, anybody can set up a table. Like, if I wanted to play this with you guys, and you said you were going to meet me at Gen Con, I would just set up a table, and you guys could all sign on on the, a website. You'd have to... We'd all have to pay a couple bucks to do it. You don't... I wouldn't have to pay to set the game up. I would just... I'd get assigned a table. I'd be running this event. I'd tell you guys where to sign up. You'd sign up. And we'd come play that, which isn't a fucking bad idea now that I think about it. If you guys... if through the course of any of the shows you guys wanted because i i'm about 95 percent sure i'm going to go to gen con this year so if we all wanted to play a game together that'd be the fucking time to do it now right on dustin i'm also going to be running dungeon crawl classics but um so what was i gonna say okay yeah. so anyway i could set up anybody can set up a game and i could do that for star jumpers right i could set up like as many as i wanted and then but then i would go in their system and i would have to actively push out to people to let them know that they could come play Star Jumpers. That's a whole other obstacle on its own. With the first exposure hall, it's developed for, it's made just for people who have a game in the exact state that I'm in. Where I want to play test, I want to get people to experience it and it's not published. And so what happens is people come in with a ticket, um, it costs a couple generic tickets to get into the hall, and then they go walk around and play all the games they want. So I could just be sitting there and I get uh, a couple hour blocks and I could just have people come in and play it. I'm pretty excited about it. It's, uh, it, comes with a, it comes with a nice little price tag and it gives me uh, a couple different, a couple of badges. So that's cool, but I'm super excited that, uh, I think that's a really great place to introduce people to Star Jumpers. I told myself I wasn't going back to Gen Con unless I took Star Jumpers with me. So I'm glad that's gonna be able, that's gonna happen. And the other thing, I, I kind of set myself a goal to port the next mission up to uh, Google Docs. Their first mission's up there right now, uh, called um, Bark Once for Rescue. The second one is, um, yeah, me too. Me too, Dustin. Hey, uh, wait, Dustin, so you're running 5e, so are you guys um, are you guys setting up an event that we could sign up for? You have to let me know what the link is. So I can sign up. Well, I guess that's in May, though. I mean, we got some time. <laughs> uh, I, one thing I wanted to talk about, Star Jumpers, actually, was um, the whole, when we were talking about what we just did, what we just did with cre creating the story and the town with kids on bike and, um, and that, that kind of feel for what you do with Apocrypha uh, World, and you'll see more in Dungeon World next week, is um, I like the idea that the players and everybody's contributing to the canon. Right, so with Star Jumpers, I took that idea. And I was like, "How can I work that into this?" And it was actually really easy. Um, I wanted the kids, especially the kids, to have more agency in creating the galaxy. Capital G, it's the galaxy, our galaxy. And uh, so, what I developed was um, what I call uh, discovery reports. And a discovery report is done. There's one for planets, and there's one for aliens. And whenever they meet a new alien. Uh, and whenever they meet, they go to a new planet. They fill out a discovery report. Then I wanted to, I, I wanted to give them opportunities to draw, and uh, I also wanted to give them. I was like, how could I? What's the best way to have something like this happen um, from a written standpoint? Like, how could I? Have, like, to fill out a report sounds boring, except I made the, <laughs> I made the reports like Mad Libs. So the alien report, let's say for the. Uh, on the planet Faro, there's the aliens, uh, the Yaz, and the Yaz, and I, there, the kid gets the, well, the, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, the player gets the alien report uh, for the Yaz. So we're we're gonna go to this planet Faro. We need to know more about the Yaz, 
Yaz are the only civilized race on the planet Faro. Yaz look a lot like humans except they have blank. Number between three and six, arms. Number between three and six, eyes. And on fur, in fur, I'm most of their underscore, I mean, uh, body part. <laughs> Yaz are super smart, but also super emotional. Watching blank animal videos make them cry. They love animals, that's why they created the intergalactic zoo full of animals from around the galaxy. So, what they do, then uh, other alien reports might include um, circles for them to draw their aliens. And little, uh, like, for one of the missions, they have to go rescue these animals that have escaped from the intergalactic zoo. And uh, one of the animals is called a Palimu. And the Palimus fly and love to eat blank. Palimus are afraid of blank. The idea is, is when you play a season of Star Jumpers, by the end you have this binder of um, all these aliens and planets you visited, and those, and as you meet them, I reweave them into the other subsequent adventures and missions. So you might run into a Palimu later, and you're like, if you don't remember, you could look in your book and go, okay, Palimu is they like they fly and they love to eat X. All right, maybe we should have brought some X. Um, uh, Palimus are afraid of why so maybe we should do something so you can use that knowledge later on and uh it's a it's 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 a big hit anytime i bring it out on the table um the the idea of like right away what i love about kids is they don't get bored with shit if you give them something like you go like okay look we need to know uh especially the mad lib thing you give them the mad lib and it's like it's one person gets the role of actually filling it out and then asking the other team members for the appropriate words and then reading it afterwards that's always big fun and then, then you have okay, so that's what the planet's like. Um, I I haven't I've only play tested these on a few different groups. I'm looking forward to getting more input from other people. We'll get a chance to play. I'm looking forward to getting this number up. That's for sure. Hey Joker, it's um, my own role playing game. I'm developing for uh, uh, for children. It's called Star Jumpers. It's uh, that's 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 what he said. SJ. Um. So anyway, so a big part of like, I say a big part of Star Jumpers is also creating the canon of the galaxy, and I love the idea of um, as they go through these different missions and stuff, they have a better and better idea of the galaxy and starts getting smaller and smaller. So that's pretty cool. Uh, what else? Um, the only thing I have failed to do still is finding another place to post it. I still need to do that. I haven't had a chance to do that. But I did find out about the first exposure hall. Looking forward to that. And I, oh, I did get a chance to start porting the next uh, mission up, which is called, um, uh, oh, it's this one. It's um, Zuper, uh, Zupernova. Zoo Pernova. Has to do with the intergalactic zoo on the planet Faro. Um, I think that's it for our update on Star Jumpers. I think it's time for uh, the Lich. I think it's time for In Dungeon News. Hey guys, this is, he's got some good news tonight. I'm pretty excited. You, you'll check it out. Hello monsters, I'm the Lich and it's time for Dungeon News. And boy do we have news tonight. We think we figured out the ancient saying, Calaxis Regretamorium. See, I remembered this ancient wizard language we used to speak way long time ago. And this might be a message from my old mentor. He was the guy who owned this, the dungeon first. Well, it was, a, it was a cave back then, really. I made it what it is today. He was a tough old bird, though. Refused to become a lich. He thought he could spell battle death himself. Anyway, I don't remember the language, but I wrote enough in an old journal. I gave it to Fizzrag, and he's, and he's translating it now. He'll bring it up shortly. I'm seriously excited, guys. This has got to be a message from Lothar the Brilliant. Anyway, the, uh, let's see what else is going to news. Uh, the yearly calendar meetings are starting up this week. Before we start deciding on who's going to represent each month, though, I make an executive decision. From here on out, we are not including February. It sucks and I hate it. If someone with a calendar wants to keep track of the days of February, go for it. It's just not going to be in this calendar. Uh, calendar meetings will be on Tuesdays in the Level 2 Common Area. Everyone's welcome. And if you want to be featured, uh, be ready to pitch your photo idea. All right. All right. See, let's. What else do we have? Oh, uh, Poco the orc just got back from the orkening. And what he has to tell us is what? What? Oh, he got it. Is this it? Oh, buddy. Oh, this is it. This is the. Uh, this is the message from beyond, delivered by eating dragon scales. 
Yeah. It's this is uh this is about as famous as you get, huh, folks? <laughs> oh man, if this is really a message from my old mentor, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna freak out. Seriously. Seriously. So awesome. Okay, here it goes. Your dungeon sucks. Right. Calaxis Regretimorium translates to your dungeon sucks. <laughs> you rotten old dirty son of a <laughs> Our dungeon rocks, and that's the news. Save the dungeon. <laughs> Thank you, Lich. That was some surprising news right there. Uh, did not see that coming. Shade from beyond. <laughs> that will be uh, the Lich tunes in give you news every week. Uh, so now we're moving on to the adventure part of tonight uh, with the focus on Dungeon Crawl Classics because it's a fun little system. And uh, the uh, but really this whole session, what I do here at this part is really. Uh, dive into an adventure to give other people ideas, kind of inspire other people. Also gives me a chance to uh, build a little story. We're gonna have a little, we have that little, we have our heroes as it were. We have, we had a group of four, zero level little peasants who a pair each had survived this horrific giant epic adventures on their own. And then they found that they were changed after these, after these, literally in one respect, a couple of them were literally changed by rolling, spinning the great wheel of destiny in the sky. Oh, you know what? I put that in the wrong place. Hold on. <laughs> That's not going to work. Oh, hold on. Oh. So I added this little doodad, but that little doodad's not going to work over there. So what the? we'll put it there for now. We'll figure out a place for you. That's our party for right now. So, um, some were literally changed. Others have just been changed by the experience of the horrors they experienced, they um, went through. <clears throat> they all found themselves, if you remember correctly, last week in the intrigue in the court of chaos, they found themselves transported to the plane of chaos and given a, a job to do to steal this important artifact from the plane of law. They had really had no choice in the matter. The, the scions of, or the uh, lords of chaos basically were saying, you got to do this or, you know, well, well you just got to do it. So they had to go to the plane of law. Uh, Fobar and was part of the group, a chaotic wizard. The other two, Sek and uh, Illarin, our elf, are both lawful law, and Barney is neutral. Fobar show, sh uh, showed his true colors by betraying the team just as they were racing to get out back away with their prize. He managed to make them all go to sleep, uh, cast sleep on them, and disappeared. Our heroes, Ilrin, Sek, and Barney, woke up uh, in front of the Scions of Law. Okay, this is the basically the the the, the um, those who lead law across the universe. Uh, they were in their court, being charged with theft and uh, trespassing. And uh, the thing was, though, the Scions knew pretty really well why the Court of Chaos used these guys. They're like nobodies. It is a dirty move. Sleep is a dirty, dirty move. Hey, Pie Gods, what is up, buddy? <laughs> Re um, where were we? Oh yeah, all right. The signs of law know that they, these are they're, they're scrubs. They're scrubs, and they were used to try to for the the court the chaos the court of chaos is always doing shit like this. But they couldn't let this go. On they can't let these guys go on unscathed or without a little bit of punishment, all right? And they're immortal beings, so they really don't give a shit uh, about um, uh, mortality uh, immortals. So they're like, okay, you know what? We're not gonna, we're, we're not gonna um, destroy you or put you in a prison or something like that. What we are gonna do is we need something done on your, your plane. An ancient being of chaos has been awakened deep in the earth. And we need you to go and kill it, or at least stop it. Thank you, Precious Paul, for the for the bits, 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 b -b 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 bits. Holy shit! Hey, no one's uh, no one's asked a question yet. <laughs> so the science of law—they lay down the law. They tell Sec, 
Barney and Illarin are first level characters. They tell them, you must go defeat this great being of chaos in order to make do make amends for your travesty. And then they, boom. And our characters are standing just outside this little village and a part of the world that, yeah, so I've added a command, uh, exclamation point question, if you need me to stop. <laughs> That was all just so I could show you guys my little video clip. <laughs> oh my god, uh, that's a really good question. Ten years? Ten years maybe? I think. Every time I grow out a beard any, and any farther than this, my wife kills it. Just... Yeah, I, yeah. Having a mustache like that is dedication. Yeah. Where was I? Teleported to outside of this village and a part of their... They have no idea where they fucking are. They could be on the other side of their planet. They have no idea where they are. They're outside this village that's in turmoil. They go in and they find out that um, this village is uh, not too far from this vast canyon. Uh, and it's... I will say it's a, it's it's the uh, no actually I don't have to go ahead get too far in my literal like it's it's just a regular old village regular old climate like no it's not not a desert or anything like that but or maybe it is fuck it it's a desert on the edge of a canyon and uh, up until a few days ago or up yeah up until a few days ago everything was fine except now people are really afraid because. Uh, uh, other people have started disappearing. Uh, livestock started disappearing, and there's been sightings of these strange, robed men, um, accompanied by gigantic tentacles. Nobody wants to believe this. That are coming from the uh, from the canyon, have coming into town, stealing people and, and livestock and shit. There's a lone traveler that our our friends meet. His name is Kalen, who's a healer who had come. He's just walking the world. Walking the world, looking for people to heal and things to do, and uh, he asks if he can join up. Our players, our characters, already know that they've got to do this. Sec, Barney, Illarin. So they, Illarin, uh, Illarin doesn't know Sec and Barney. All she knows is um, she knew Fobar, and Fobar. Um, uh, now I'm just making shit up now, which is it's good. This is what I want to do. I want to riff. Illarin. Um, only knew Fobar because they had dealt with the chaotic, they let loose the chaotic being in the hole in the sky in the other, the other little pocket world there in the pocket prison. And uh, when he betrayed them, it didn't look too good on her. Second party don't know if they can trust her. And so having Kaylin come aboard was kind of nice for uh, Illarin because uh, it was nice to have another person who doesn't know the sins of the group. And uh, Illarin can't go off on her own because she's been told by the science of law to perform this task. So they're kind of stuck with each other. So having Kaylin come on board is kind of a nice, and Kaylin's a nice, easygoing person. Uh, maybe he's got a little bit of a dark past. <laughs> What's up, Willy? Willy the wizard, everybody. Willy has come. Uh, Willy has come. Down your chimneys! So, introducing People of the Pit by Joseph Goodman himself, the Dark Man, the Dark One, the Dark Master, the Dark One. Yes, he, uh, he Joseph Goodman is it's Goodman Games. He's the creator of Dungeon Crawl Classics. This is one of the adventures he wrote. Um, he's wrote a bunch of them, and I, I got a chance to run this a couple of Gen, Gen Cons ago, and it's, it's a fun module. Uh, Give you some idea of the art and shit. It's cool. Uh, black and white, of course, as most of them are, except for the covers. All right, so uh, let's go. A long time ago, a great tentacled beast had shambled out of this great this canyon, and, uh, and by the way of this great pit near the canyon. And just started completely terrorizing the t the, the the surrounding area, until um, these uh, warrior priests came up with the idea of uh, sacrificing to it. 
So on the edge of the pit, great pit that it shambled out of, they put down an iron pole and they started bringing virgin after virgin after virgin, sacrificing it. And it indeed worked for a bit. Uh, it kept the, but then the, the um, then this one time the, the uh, tentacles didn't appear and the virgin wasn't killed, but the war priest were like, no, she's not being let free. We're gonna keep this poor girl until we're gonna keep trying to give her away. And um, at that point, it had been like maybe 20 years, and everybody was like, you know, we're sick and tired of giving up our daughters, or, or you know what, let's be, let's be, let's be 2020. The virgin was boy or girl, uh, <laughs> and uh, we're we're tired of giving up, so we're not. They rebelled against these warrior priests, and uh, they actually forced the warrior priest down into the pit. Going into the pit is a hundred foot wide pit, and uh, it's a long circle of stairs that just go down into the foggy mists of the pit, and. Uh, so, 20 years later, these warrior priests were forced down in the pit. They never returned. Um, everything's been calm, but now these robed people have been coming with these with the tentacle, and it's all starting over again. So that's all we know as we make our way to the pit. Our players start moving down into it, and the first thing they meet are these gray-robed ro um, people, figures who come up, uh, come walking up the stairs. And when they stop, when they sense the other players, I say sense because when they put back their hoods, they've got these rubbery uh, masses, blank masses for face, like like rubbery, like a tentacle. Imagine an octopus flesh. That's just their face. And they can see, you can see underneath their robes, around their stomach, that's their their it's wiggling. I'm going like this. It's wiggling for some reason. But the moment you guys, everybody sees each other, and then Sec, Sec in the lead, and Barney, and then Illern and Kaylin behind, they all freeze. And then these these robed men start un, uh, udulating, udulating. I think that's how you say it. Undulating. Just saying weird chanting shit. All four of them. They got their arms up. And they're doing them, doing this. If they don't stop. Oh, I know this sweater's pretty dope, isn't it? What? Uh, if our heroes didn't stop these guys, they were gonna summon a great huge fifty foot, hundred, um, uh, a twenty foot wide tentacle that would come snaking its way out of the pit and then grabbing characters and fling them in flinging them down and just basically killing everybody if they didn't stop these guys from summoning the tentacle luckily our heroes were able to put them down before that happened but one thing they found is the moment they killed one of these robed figures a mass of tentacles would explode out of their stomach and attack them with barbs barbed tentacles so they have to they have to stamp stamp them out and kill them after they kill every one of these fuckers but that didn't stop them. And they continued on into, down into the pit and finding their way into the cultists. Well, from here on, we'll call them the cultists. The cultists' um, home. Uh, they worked their way through living quarters and work quarters, finding peasants that had been captured and put to work as slaves, but also peasants who aspire to be part of this fiendish, crazy cult. Um, at some point, uh, on a scroll, a hastily written scroll, uh, uh, Illerin is lucky to have find, the, the Illerin's lucky to have found and able to read. She finds us what she thinks to be a, maybe a way, an incantation for summoning and controlling one of these tentacles. But she keeps that to herself for now, because um, and just in case she needs it later and doesn't want to, she's not talking a lot. She's kind of withdrawn a bit. Um, <clears throat> uh, because Sec and Barney, they keep their own counsel. And Kaylin's picked up on that now, and he tries to be friendly with her. But uh, but still, she's the odd one out, too. She's an elf. Well, Sec's a dwarf, but he's like kind of the leader. He's kind of taking up the mantle. They go deeper, deeper into this fiendish cult's uh, um, home base. Uh, they find these breeding rooms and laboratories, and they discover that the cult has figured out how to take the scales from this giant beast because it rubs its tentacles against the canyon walls and the scales fall off and they harvest them and they can craft these potions. And uh, Illerin's pretty sure that that's how the, the mutations have come about and uh, on themselves, they can mutate themselves. But they also, it looks like in these breeding rooms have begun to create other things. And some of the things you get, they, we, they end up having to face like this 10 foot blubbering mass with an owl face and beak and um, long tentacle arms that come shambling up and uh, screeching 
this horrifying abomination that luckily Kalen is able to turn because he's a priest. Um, cool thing about uh, cleric priests, clerics, clerics in Dungeon Crawl Classics, um, they can heal. Healing is not a um, healing is not a spell. It's just something they can do. Uh, but the cool little twist is there's two twists to it. Uh, if you're healing someone that's uh, the uh, adjacent alignment, remember there's only three alignments, law, neutral, and chaos. If you're healing someone that's an adjacent, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the roll is harder, you, you heal them less. If you roll, if you're healing somebody that's a, um, that's the opposite, like a lawful character healing a chaos character, then there's more, uh, you heal them less and there's more danger of disapproval. If you roll a natty one, no matter what, as a healer trying to heal, you get just you have to roll in the disapproval chart for your deity, and your deity is going to be pissed. You might have to stop what you're doing and get on your knees and pray for an hour just to make up for your for having fucked up, basically. Uh, and that's something a cleric has always got to worry about. Uh, but they also get to turn in abominations like these these um, these towins they're called uh, are or it's definitely something you can um, banish. Ha! <laughs> Banish. When in doubt. Uh, oh man, that, that would be a great shirt, Turk. When in, da when in doubt, banish. Um, along with these abominations, they find even um, stronger cultists. They find the red-robed cultists who also have the tentacles in their ab abdomen and the leathery faces or the slimy, rubbery faces, but they also have tentacles for arms instead of arms. Just tentacles. And they cast, they can cast this spell which makes tentacles out of shadows and slam down and grab you and do fucked up shit to you. Finally though, making it through these breeding grounds, they find, because they have to go deeper, they have to cut the disease at its source. Our heroes find um, a, a intricate, uh, well, a system of gigantic tentacles that weave them themselves through different holes in this whole place. They have ladders attached to them. And so they're able to climb down a giant tentacle down as far as it will allow them to go, which is pretty, pretty close to the very bottom of this canyon. Canyon. There, they see a horrifying scene. Um, imagine, if you will. These. Humanoid people they hadn't met yet. These these people are the people who live down at the very bottom. They are like brutish and um, like gorillas, but except for without hair, they got all these little um, little uh, polyp like tendril baby tentacles all over their bodies. And there there's ten of them. They're carrying this screaming young woman who had been captured from the from the uh, from the village. And there's a couple of those uh, cultists, and then one in blue that's standing on the edge of a precipice while the, these gigantic tentacles of the beast come rising out. And he's chanting, and they're about to sacrifice this woman to it. And you've got to do something, something to take care of these. And this is like, this is like, the, this is the first level, right? Your first level, you're looking at 10 of these people of the pit, two um, of the red robe cleric, uh, um, dudes, cultists, one of those toe and blubbery things, and then the blue guy who's obviously their leader, uh, not to mention the tentacles that are all in the pit. And you gotta do something, you're in the very bottom of this. There's no other way out. There's no nothing else to do but forward and to try to, and you could try to save this gorilla, you could try choose not to. Um, our heroes attempt to save the girl. We're gonna, um, actually, I, I thought of another role. Let's see if they save the girl, because I'll work that into the, uh, we're gonna do a d20. Oh, here's what I'll do. It's, it's gonna be hard, though. It's gonna be hard. Remember how I told you the about the d die? The d die is a, what a warrior and dwarf can roll along with their 20 sided die, their action die. Uh, when they start at level one, it's a d3, which is right here. Uh, you get to add that as a modifier uh, to uh, damage and to hit. But also, you can um, claim a mighty deed. Uh, his mighty deed is to is to uh, hit a couple of these guys at the right time to drop the girl so he can grab her and run. All right, he needs to roll a three though in order to make that happen. Yeah, so this is a level one adventure, not a funnel. Yeah. The level, they're just hugely epic. That's what I love about these adventures. They don't have to be your typical, what I've grown up kind of used to level one adventures. 
Booyah! Look at that. Okay, wait. Hold up. <laughs> I'm like, booyah! Wait, what the fuck? All right, so here's... I'm going to introduce this. So, the guys... Uh, the hit... <laughs> their armor class is 10. He rolled a 3. He rolled a 3, which means he would have made... Okay, so that's 6. Uh, shit. They had the thief. I was going to have the thief at his luck. So this is what's going to happen. You can add your... You can spend your luck to make these things to add to your die rolls after the fact. So the dwarf, what is his sex? Sex. Sec, the dwarf, his luck is 13. He's going to spend it. All he needs is four. He's going to spend four. His luck is now nine. No, it's okay. That's because the D3 happened. That's why I got it. Um... He's going to spend four of his luck. So now he only has a luck of nine. It doesn't change his modifiers. Modifiers plus one, it never changes. But you never, unless some god or the DM or somebody, the judge, they call me, decides to give you luck back, you can get luck back. Unless you're a thief or a halfling. Both of those regenerate luck over time. Uh, Sek decides to spend his four, hitting just getting ten, doing the mighty deed. We've saved the girl. We're going to work that into the story for next week. To remember, okay? But the big die roll. Alright, well it's not the big one. Because I'm not she, they're not gonna fail. Our heroes are gonna succeed because of Illarin's somewhat of a sacrifice. Illarin is going to pull out that spell for controlling tentacles. She's gonna save the day by controlling three of these tentacles and using one of them to grab the blue uh, figure. And even though he tries to fight and, and regain control of the tentacle, he just can't while she picks him up and, and drops him into the into the pit to be eaten by the monster or whatever. And it, the other one swipes and blows a bunch of these people a pit away. But in order for her to be able to do that and to control three, first off, she's got to cast a spell. And then to control three of them, she's got to roll at least a 32. Okay. What is her... She's got a d20. That's what she uses for her check. She's got plus one. So, Kevin, how the fuck is she going to get 32? That's a great question. I knew... We're going to be friends. Uh, she's going to spell burn. Something, it's a cool little thing that wizards and, and elves can do. Spellcasters can do. Not, not uh, clerics, but wizards and... I don't think clerics can do it. I keep forgetting that point. Doesn't matter. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's an awesome question, Turk. Thank you very much. Let me tell you. Spell burn. All right? You can choose, when you roll, to burn a bunch of your ability score points to add to the die. Uh, wizards, like, she's got, um, Illarin has 10 strength, 10 agility, 15 stam, 15 personality, 10 luck, 10 intelligence. Let's say... She rolls, and uh, even if she didn't roll a 20, she she needs to, let's say she needs to spend like 20 points. She can, and there's, fictionally you can say, it's like blood magic in Dragon Age where she like slices herself and her blood goes spurting. Maybe she does it with her face, so both, she's paying in both personality and she's paying in stamina. And uh, you burn those points, so her stamina, let's say she needs to spend 20 points. She's going to burn 10 stamina and 10 personality and to add to that roll to make it happen. So she's standing there, her face is all, she's she's gashed her mouth, maybe, uh, maybe her face. She opened up her face twice, so there's blood streaming on her face, and um, it's just pouring out, and she's she's standing there, and it's all over her hands, and second, their jaws are dropped, as she's like controlling these three tentacles, and she has the one throw the dude into the pit, and she swipes the other ones, and then when they're done, um, uh, when it's when it's done, she falls. And when she falls, Sek catches her, and the um, the uh, canyon starts shaking because the guy, the lead blue dude, who was actually the lead warrior priest way back in the day, he had died, and he was controlling. He was like uh, um, keeping the uh, the beast kind of satiated or something, and it starts going nuts. And the canyon, of course, starts coming down, and they drag her t to a safe little corner while everything kind of falls and collapses in. Luckily, after they survive, the boulders come down. They're able to move some shit and climb up. They see some sunlight far up. And there's enough rocks and rubble that they're able to climb up. 
and, and after a while. And she's still kind of like really, really hurt and Kaylin's just barely keeping her alive. Now, about Spellburn, yes, gouges out an eye. Yeah, perfect, dude. She gouges out an eye. That's m perfect, definitely. So she's sitting there, she has no eye. Kaylin, he's a cleric, but he's only first level. He ain't gonna be healing eyeballs. Oh, I forgot about the roll, but here's the roll. I didn't even do the roll yet. The roll is the cool thing. In order for her to cast this spell, the control tentacle that she had found in this adventure, it automatically corrupts. Um, I told you about corrupting last time. If a wizard rolls a natty one or really low, sometimes they can get corrupted by the spell that they cast. Well, this one's an auto-corrupt. We're going to roll a d6 and find out how she's going to be corrupted. Let's do this t6. Three. Caster's hair thickens and becomes more elastic and is and is painful to cut. So basically, she her hair becomes kind of tentacles. Kay, uh, Kaylin notices this as he's uh, he's carrying her up. He, he goes to to move her head to look, check her eye, and he notices how her hair is now like the tentacles. And uh, he puts her hood up. And they take her. And when they get out of the pit, um, uh, uh, Sek, Illerin, and Barney hear in their heads, uh, "You're." Uh, uh, Good work. Something along the lines of they're being released from their, uh, they, they have atoned. You have atoned. Just the signs of law letting them know that, that their efforts down below and whatever just happened was good enough for them. And now they are free. You are free. But that leaves our heroes looking around this village in a place where they have no idea where they are. At all. Period. In relation to a home or anything else they've ever done. So that's where we're going to leave our first level characters uh, for tonight. Ellerin's marked forever. She will, okay, back to the, um, just so you know, Spellburn. Spellburn, you do regen your ability points, like one every every day kind of thing. So if you're like, okay, your wizard want to blow out uh, Spellburn, and then it doesn't adventure for a couple weeks in story, then they can regain. Maybe she, but for fictional purposes, maybe we don't, she, she should be eyeless, because that's fucking cool. So Illerin has lost her eye and her hair is weird, but she has gained the trust of Sek and Barney, or at least the uh, the beginnings of trust from Sek and Barney, and most certainly Kaylin, who understood completely what she did and this fact sacrifice she gave. So uh, that's where we're gonna leave our heroes for today. Uh, next week we're gonna be doing um, uh, the uh, what is it gonna be? Next week is a an adventure called the Emerald Enchanter. Ooh, Emerald Enchanter. All right, moving on to stream team. Perfect timing too. So. Which one, Emerald Enchanter? I like it, we're getting a little story with these guys. I like it a lot. I like it a lot. Yay us! <laughs> let's start with, uh, let's see, Thursdays. Thursdays on TT2KB. That's twitch.com slash TT2KB. No, it's, I'm sorry, it's twitch.tv. Don't go talk, I don't know if .com redirects you or not. Last War Poodle. We were just talking about, I was asking you questions for like the last half hour. Where you been, buddy? What? <laughs> Tune in Thursday. Listen here, Last War Poodle. You gotta listen, okay? Me and you. Listen right here. Thursday, T22KB, twitch.tv, 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. Terror in Treefall returns. A massacre. The party returns to Treefall. After an encounter with a demon and locating the remains of a long-lost grave robber who continues to haunt the village, will they uncover the conspiracy at hand and save the village of Treefell? Tune in to find out, bro. Saturday, the Neverus campaign and Dragons in the Dining Room, who are new to the stream team, we're very happy about that. Never, they're never, Nerevis? Ne Nerevis campaign. They're on Saturdays at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. The party is on their way to, to the Void of the Gods. The king is recalling his champions. And demon caches hidden underground. What strange forces are at work? 
like I said, who the fuck knows? Tune in. 9 o'clock on Saturday, 6 o'clock on Saturday. Because at 9.30, uh, let's see, CST is an hour behind me, right? 8, 8.30, 8.30-ish. Between 8.30 and 9. It actually might be 9. I actually think we're going to start at 9. At 9, the Lich is hosting his big bad dungeon bash. We're going to be playing a Dungeon Crawl Classics Funnel. A famous one, I've decided. It's going to be a lot of fun. Casual, chaotic. Uh, if you're not playing, definitely tune in. That will be 9 o'clock. Um, wait, I'm sorry. I'm so stuck between time zones, man. we got to pick one. We need a Twitch time zone. Just a Twitch for everybody on Twitch. Like, a, a, Wait, there is a global one, isn't there? Isn't there a global, like, when you want to talk, like a military time thing? Anyway. Uh, 10 o'clock Eastern. <laughs> 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. The Lich will be starting the um, thing. Everybody else is going to, I'm going to try to get everybody, all the players. It'll be hopefully anywhere from 10 to 16 people in a Discord chat going into this uh, very uh, crazy, epic, funnel adventure. Every person who plays gets a chance to win oh, shit. this big bad boy right here. This, this big bad book right here. A copy of Dungeon Crawl Classics. It's big. It's it's awesome. Uh, we will do the drawing that night, at the very end. All right. Um, that is that's it for my little notes. Make sure I remembered everything I wanted to do. Uh, I think we're gonna go on to uh, raid. And you guys, did I forget anything? Oh, uh, so Saturday night will not. We will not have a Tales from the Dungeon episode Saturday night. So I won't. It'll be a couple weeks before we see Apocrypha. Apocrypha will be the f next, the Saturday, f no, week from Saturday. So this week is going to be completely a, all the liches. Oh yeah, fishy. What is up, King Fishy? Oh shit! Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh you. Yeah. You know what? I didn't write it down because I. I always think okay. I need their these guys, but I know I'm gonna have to say. Sunday night, Sunday night, this Sunday night, the main event, the season finale of Drunks and Dragons, uh, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 6 p.m., 6 p.m., it's an hour early because it's a big, bad episode. There's going to be a guest star, I think. There's going to be a, a big-time villain, big, probably the biggest you've ever seen in your life. Big, bad, a big, bad, capital B's. Sunday night, 7 p.m., 6 p.m., fuck, 6 p.m. PSD. <laughs> yes, probably. Will hip, will hep be robbed? Will Santa shit in someone's nutsack? Big, bad, festive boy. Well, remember, Rudolph, his nose isn't the only thing that glows red, so I might see some kind of glowing red thing going on. And that's where we're, <laughs> we're going to raid somebody. YouTube, love you. Viva the Dungeon!